Hello, hello, USU listeners. I am so excited to bring on today's guest. She is a total gem. Honestly, I, I just, it was, it was the love at first sight. I feel like I've known Kelly my whole life, and I want you to know you are going to just resonate and get so, so much wisdom. And I'm just so grateful and excited to introduce you to Kelly Notaris. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and then you're going to get to meet her yourself and hear about all the amazing ways that she is helping you and other solopreneurs, entrepreneurs to birth their books into the world and way more. So let me tell you about Kelly. Kelly Notaris is the founder of KN Literary Arts. It is the creation of a 15-year publishing. She's a 15-year publishing veteran. So cool. After starting her career in New York City, working as an editor for HarperCollins, Penguin USA, and Hyperion Books, she relocated several years ago to Boulder, Colorado, where she served for four years as the VP and editorial director at Sounds True, a multimedia spirituality publishing company. There, she oversaw an impressive list of spiritual luminaries, including Adya Shanti, Reggie Ray, Krishna Das, Sharon Salzberg, Pema Chadron, Carolyn Mace, and so many more. In 2010, she left Sounds True to ghostwrite her first book, but her love of editing was never far away. Since starting K in Literary Arts, she has been honored to edit a wide variety of personal growth books, including the forthcoming Intimate Conversations with the Divine by Carolyn Mace and New York Times bestseller, The Tapping Solution by Nick Ortner. And as you know, love this book, Pussy, <laughs> a reclamation by Regina, Mama Gina, Tom Hauser. K and Literary's amazing client list also includes Nancy Levin, we love Nancy, Michael Morelli, Agape Stasinopoulos, Miranda McPherson, Bruce Tiff, Drew Canole, Danette May, and many, many more. Kelly is the author of the book you were born to write, Everything You Need to Finally Get Your Wisdom onto Page and Into the World, published by Hay House. She lives in Colorado, and you can find her at knliterary.com. Okay, Kelly, I'm yes. so excited to have you here today. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Amazing. I just, you know, we talk a lot about being your aligned with your higher self, i.e. your USU. And one of the things I love about you is you are truly doing that today. You've created this entire business and, and, and really this community and ways of serving. Can you tell us a little, like without getting into like your whole life story, maybe yeah. just how did you, I think it's important, especially for those that are thinking of starting their own thing, it can seem daunting. Like maybe tell us the breadcrumbs or a little bit of how the heck did you get to where you are now? It's pretty yeah, amazing. Totally. Thank you so much. And thank you for, you know, the whole introduction and everything. It's funny. The first thing I want to say is, um, yes, I am following the breadcrumbs. I am still following them. It's not yeah. like I've gotten to some place of completion and I've had so many stumbling blocks along the way and I'm still stumbling my way toward whatever's here. And every single day I wake up and think, I can't believe my company is still around <laughs> because as much <laughs> as like, I love it, it's definitely had rocky times and there've been times where I've shown up as my best self and times when I haven't. And I just want to say all of that to begin with, because you know, I think there's this way that we look at people who have, you know, achieve something that we're going for and we think oh my gosh their life must be perfect yeah. it's so not true in the slightest so anyway i want to talk about i will definitely tell you my little breadcrumb my imperfect breadcrumb trail story um so long story short i actually moved straight to new york after college to get into book publishing so i knew that i wanted i was working in a bookstore i absolutely loved it and i heard through a friend of a friend that you there's this, such a thing as becoming an editorial assistant and i was like i'm gonna do that um so i left my pre law degree behind and went and started working in New York business. And I worked there for seven years, um, three different companies. And honestly, I was pretty miserable most of that time. I was learning a lot. It was great experience, but I was not happy living in the big city. It was not where my soul was most um, destined to thrive. And yet in the book publishing business, there's sort of this attitude, like there's no other place to live. You have to be in New York. And so I kind of bought into that for a while. And then I, through the, the grace of 
some divine intervention, I started meditating. And it was there that I realized that actually there were more important things than what my ego was calling me toward, um, which was bigger and better and get that, you know, next promotion and end up running Random House someday or whatever I, this crazy story my ego was telling me. Um, and I actually, you know, found my way. Somebody told somebody that I was in the business and I was also a Buddhist practitioner. And the next thing you know, I'm put up for a job. It sounds true. So that was what got me out of New York. I, it took a lot for me to make that leap. My ego was crushed. It took a month for my ego and my soul to do their battle and decide to accept the mm. job. And thankfully it was still there for me a month later. Um, and I moved to, to Boulder when I, you know, basically right after I turned 30 and I worked at Sounds True for four years where I really learned, I mean, I got to immerse in personal growth, self-help, spirituality, transformation, what I now call transformational nonfiction. And that was where I realized that like, that's what I love. You know, I love that kind of book that helps me as I'm editing it. I mean, I learned so much editing books mm. by Adyashanti and Sharon Salzberg and all those amazing authors that you listed earlier. And I realized like, if I'm going to spend a huge chunk of my life editing, I want to be editing books that actually matter to me and make a difference in my life. And for me, mm -hmm. as somebody who was just always very eager to like, really look at myself, see what's going on, try to be a better version of myself. Maybe, you know, now I would say I should, I, my goal should have been to become more the me -est me. Um, but I was really trying to be some perfected version of myself for a long time. Um, and so I thought that's how you do that is you just learn all these things. And it was just a, such a wonderful, wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. And you get to work with amazing authors and, you know, see a lot of the world that you wouldn't otherwise see, I think, when you're working so deeply. And so then I, I worked there for four years for the wonderful Tammy Simon. It sounds true. She's just, you know, the best. I love her so much still to this day. And then I realized, you know, I'm ready to do something else. I really love launching things. I don't love managing them, which makes it hard when you're an entrepreneur. So it's good right. to really learn about yourself, like what it is that you're good at, what it is that you're not good at, what you love, what you don't love. And, um, and so that's been, I bumped into that again once I started my own company, but I left Sounds True. I started writing, ghost writing, editing freelance. And then, so here's a place where, again, you said, you know, the, the, like I've done something that other people haven't done and maybe they want to do. How did I, was I brave or something? The truth is I was not brave in the slightest. I was editing, which is what I knew how to do. And I just happened because I worked in the spirituality book world, I knew people in that world. And Hay House is a big player in that world. And the folks there, and I knew each other and were friends. And they said, hey, we're doing a, a writer's workshop in Denver. And Wayne Dyer is going to headline, which means that there's going to be like 500 people in the room and 500 people on live stream. You should come and we'll bring you up to the mic and you can talk about editing and you'll end up with more clients. And I was like, great. And so I thought I, I need, I need a business card. I need something. So I actually created a business card, called it KN Literary Arts and created a little website literally in 24 hours, did a tiny little website and went to this event thinking like, I'm going to get some clients. Well, I ended up with hundreds of clients. I gave away every one of the 200 cards I brought with me and people just poured in wanting help with their book proposals and their books. And so I had to start gathering a team. So for the longest time, I felt like I was, you know, chasing the eight ball. I was having a really hard time, like trying to keep everything together. You know, it was like, it was not an easy time. Like building a business is mm -hmm. rocky. Um, and now I'm grateful that I've gotten to a place where I have a team that really, actually we have very much shared values and shared vision for what we want the company to do and how to grow. That was a huge leap for me to make the decision to hire people, which is something I would definitely encourage your, your, the folks that are listening to like, you have to take the leap. You're never going to be ready. You're never going to think there's enough money. Um, but in doing that every single time I've generated enough income to cover that person and more in just having them there. So Mm. Anyway, I've said a lot of things now. I will be quiet for a moment and let no. you know. It's amazing. <laughs> oh my God. There's so much goodness. I love that transformational nonfiction. I wrote that down. Like yeah. brilliant reframe of that. That is, and I, what's so amazing to me, it's kind of like what you're saying, building a team. If you build it, they will come. Yes. You know, you, you, you said this earlier and I wanted to highlight this. You said, you know, it, it felt like a, a battle between your ego. Do I, do I, is my ego going to, going to, come in and, and lead or is it going to be my soul, my heart? Yes. And that, that month of like getting acclimated and yeah. what's so beautiful is you followed 
that inner knowing your that that connection to your me is me you is you to your to your yes. heart yeah and that it reminds me it's like that was the beginning and then as you got this beautiful opportunity i mean yes, yes. what an opportunity and it's me on a platter yep mm -hmm. <laughs> so beautiful but like this to me is evidence when we listen when we align that's when things open up i mean that sounded like it opened up pretty naturally and easily yeah, and yeah. There you are it's very true. I mean, I always say like I got accidentally pregnant with this company. I did not intend to create a company. I really didn't. And next thing you know, you've got this toddler running around and you're like, I have to take care of this thing. And there've been so many different choice points along the way where I've been like, I'm giving this kid up, you know, and then so something funny. brings me back and we're going on, um, we're seven and a half years now. And wow. it's been just an ongoing journey in that time. Um, I wake, I wake up every day, truly surprised, like, oh, the company's still here. Great. I'm going to do my best with it today. You know, it feels like it, there was a moment, one of the turning points I had was when I realized that it had a life of its own. It mm. wasn't necessary. I wasn't powering it anymore. It actually had a life of its own with the people that were a part of it and the clients that were coming in the door. There was a, a power that just, there was a need that it served. And so I was able to sort of say, okay, I'm just going to like, you know, stand back and see what it needs to get to grow up. Like that's been my goal is like, how do I grow this company up? And again, it's been rocky, but here we are. And I feel like we're, we're like, you know, maybe like a, an adolescent moving into teen years now. <laughs> I love this. I love the accidental pregnancy. That is hilarious. And it's true. <laughs> that is a great, oh my God, I love how you described it that way. Well, and I can tell you, and I'm curious to hear more. I know you've worked with so many luminaries and amazing people. And you know, something I know you stand for, I certainly believe in, um, is, is we all have, you know, especially the solopreneurs, entrepreneurs have stories to tell, have like yeah. books become so important. It's actually one of the probably most important aspects of shifting my career. Yes. Um, and you know, I kind of did it the harder way. I did it solo, which I don't necessarily recommend doing that. That's like, why don't you get on the ocean and see how yeah. you do in a little raft and see how yeah. that feels. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like that, I wouldn't recommend it, but tell, I'd love to hear your thoughts about why it's so important for solopreneurs to have a book. And like, maybe even after that, we get a little into like, where do you start and, and how do you help support that? Cause yeah. really it's changed my career. I totally yeah. believe this. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that a book has this magical way of going out into the marketplace beyond where you can actually reach. So mm -hmm. it's like a calling card that tells people of your expertise. And hopefully if you have the right, what we call a hook and a title and a cover that it just telegraphs to anyone who sees it. Oh, there is, that's right. I have this problem and that book's my solution. So hopefully, you know, when people see my book, which is sitting right here, um, they think, oh, I've been meaning to write a book. This book is going to show me how to finally get my wisdom onto the page and into the world. That's exactly what I need. So really focusing on, on what need your, your ideal client is experiencing and making sure your book stands up and says, I'm the solution for that need. I love that. Yeah. So where, this is what I've heard because I've worked with a lot of different coaches and solopreneurs. Yeah. And it's like, I want to write a book. And it, it's, it's really daunting. I mean, yes. honestly, um, I hand wrote my first one, by the way, and I oh don't recommend them on that. Literally legit hand wrote the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. Don't do that. You're super old school. <laughs> I, it helped me to get over the fear. I was like, I'm just journaling yeah. every day. I'm just journaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But it was super old school and took a lot of time to type. So yeah. what, like, do you have any, like, where do you begin? Like, what are some just points of like, okay, there's the, who am I to do this? There's the yeah. like, actually legit, like, where do I start? And then just from what you've seen, curious, you could share that. Cause I know there's a yeah. lot of people listening that are like, uh, I'm tuning in. I want to write a book. Yes, okay. totally. So the, who am I to write a book? That is so something I hear every day. Who am I to write a book? Yeah. And in fact, I want to just tell you that when I, um, when I published my book, very interesting. I, I happened to a year or two later go visit with a dear friend of mine in publishing who was always a mentor of mine. Several years ahead of me on the journey, I always looked up to her and thought, wow, she's so glamorous and she's got all these amazing authors and et cetera. You know, and she still works in the New York publishing business. And she literally, at some point, there was a pause in our conversation and she said, what, what made you think you could write a book? And I was like, what? I thought, you don't think you can write a book? I just blew my mind. So I just wanted to say for any of you who are feeling that, 
Like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I should do it. I don't know if I'm good enough or I have the right story or I'm, I'm, you know, what, how do I deserve to write a book? You're not alone. And even somebody who is deeply embedded in the book publishing business. And I, I mean, as far as I can, she's probably edited hundreds of books. She's ghostwritten hundreds of book proposals. And she says, you know, what made you think you could write a book? I just thought, wow. So there is some sort of a, I, I mm -hmm. see now, you know, it's hard to see in oneself, but like an audacity, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like an audacity, like, of course I'm going to write a book, you know, that I, I wish to just sort of embed into all the listeners. You can have that audacity too. I am no different than you. I'm no different. In fact, I consider myself in terms of like, if there's a hierarchy to be lower than this person I'm talking about, this friend of mine, and I had the audacity to write the book. You can do it too. Um, and then another piece around that is that I had a spiritual teacher once who said, and I really love this, if you're six inches ahead of someone else on a, on a journey, you have something to teach them. Mm. It might only be six inches worth of work, of information or of wisdom or of your own story, but that is valuable to someone who's stuck six inches behind you. Mm. So just know that you're not necessarily educating the masses. There's a specific client, a specific reader that you are actually targeting this toward and it's the person who's six inches behind you and what and you want to help them you want to give them that leg up you want to get them up that you know if it's another step of the ladder or whatever you metaphor you want to use another step on the path on the mountainside whatever it might be you yeah. can teach them oh that is i love 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 that if you're you just need to be six inches ahead six inches that ahead is a, you're six inches ahead of somebody. I promise. I promise. You really are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, it's, and I love this too, you know, from a spiritual lens, it's yeah. like, you know, I'm thinking of myself, I'm thinking when I've struggled with something in my life and I've had someone, I, I didn't get, I didn't care if they didn't have it all figured out. I just, right. I saw, oh, you know what? You just, you have a little bit more experience in that. I don't have it. Yep. It's almost yep. like it's, it's, I see it as a spiritual duty. It's helped yeah. me. Right. Um, I love what you said about the six inches. That's yep. so, so, so great. And that yep. it, also the other thing you said in there, because I'm thinking, I think oftentimes when you set out to write a book, I know I did this with the first one. I was like, this is for everybody, like anybody right. that wants to find themselves. And oh it's my like, gosh. Thank yeah, you. For like, this up. Yeah. Right. No, actually six inches ahead of the person. Of a, like of a specific person. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would say this is the hardest thing for me to um, educate people on yeah. because there are so many different doubts and uncertainties and concerns that are coming at someone who is, has the audacity to decide they want to write a book. Yeah. And by the way, I'm totally in support of your audacity. Um, but basically like they're, they're like the last thing, honestly, they're like the last thing I can think about is my reader. I can't even, I just have to write the book I want to write. I can't even think about what the reader needs. And when someone says that to me, I usually say, okay, then what you're writing is something I call the book before the book. Because uh, oh. there's sometimes a book we need to get out onto the page in order to clear the pipeline for us uh -huh. to actually write a book that's in service of other people. If you do not have the time or the bandwidth to deeply mm -hmm. concern yourself with who your reader is and what experience they're having as they read your book, then you're not ready to be writing a book for other people to read. And that is fine. So often, I mean, back in the publishing business, we used to always say, your first book goes in a drawer. This is for fiction. This is for anything. Your first book goes in a drawer because usually you don't actually have the wherewithal to be thinking about the reader's experience when you're writing your first book. Some people do. And I'll say, I feel like I did because I wrote the book out of 10 years of really working deeply with, with clients and authors. And I knew exactly what it was that they needed. And I was writing it. This was the main thing for me and probably for your solopreneurs. I was writing it to promote my book studio. I wanted people to hear about KN Literary. I wanted them to feel inspired to write a book and then to come to us to help them. That's what I was trying to do as part of my business building practice. So of course I was thinking about my client. I knew exactly who they were. And every time I sat down to write, I thought, what does that person need to know? And in fact, I recommend, and I talk about this a lot mm -hmm. in the book, picking a specific person who you know and love who could really, really use the wisdom you've learned on your journey or whatever it is that you have, you give in your practice as a solopreneur mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, the value you bring 
pick someone in your life who really, really needs that. And then think about them every time you sit down to work on your book. It would be both inspiring and also very clarifying. Do they need to learn about this? Do they need this scene in my memoir? No, actually, that doesn't really help them. I need to actually just let that one go. That's for me. I'll keep that in my you know journal, but I'm going to move on to this other scene that's actually in service of the reader. Once you can put yourself into that mindset that the reader is everything, their mm. needs are everything, their perception of your title and your subtitle and your hook and your cover copy and your cover design is everything. What is the reader's experience rather than what's my own experience? So these are two very different things. And it's okay if you're still needing to process through a book that's your own experience. It's the book before the book. It's great. Go ahead and write it. It's important. Get it out of your body. Get it out of the pipeline. And then I guarantee you there'll be more space for you mm. to really step into your reader's shoes and walk that whole journey with them in mind. Oh, that is so, that's real brilliant. I love that. That There's like nuggets of wisdom. It's, it's so, it's such a shift. It's like, and you said it's the book before the book and you can yeah. tell. Yeah. So probably if you're listening and you're like, I need to get this out, that's the book before the book. Whereas yeah. if you're like, I'll tell you with mine, I had my uh, first coaching client and my younger self and I pictured her the entire time because yes. I kept feeling like, okay, this is for her. This is, there's gotta be other people like her. I remember yeah. for myself in that, that really helped me yes. to also feel like, like, who am I to read a book? It's like, well, it's not even about, it's not about you. It's, it's not, not about, about you. you. Exactly. Right. It's not about you. It's about your reader and the person that you're serving. It's about having that mentality that yeah. you are offering wisdom that life has seen fit to put into your experience. And, yeah. and life doesn't want you just to hold on to it. Life wants you to share it and pass it on and make sure that other people can benefit from it. So that, that's the mentality that I want you to have in, in line. Like not everybody gets the call to write a book. If right. you have the call, there's a reason. And who are you to tell life I'm not good enough, right? <laughs> oh, I love that. That's my brain's like, wow, that, that just went all those like beliefs are like, they can't yeah. compete with that. That's they pretty, yeah. that's darn good, Kelly. I love hey, that. What that. I do. Like, I'm like, love that. Life wants yeah. you to share. And if not, um, it's not to hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Like if you have the desire, I feel like I'm talking to you because I know there are people listening. You've written yeah. in, you want to write a book. So we're talking to you. If you want to, you have a desire. Yes. Life is saying, please do that. Yeah. Sure. Totally. So, okay. So they want to tell us about your, the beautiful teenage yes, <laughs> company teenager yes. that you have now yes. Okay, yes. in literary arts. Like what are the different ways that we can work yeah. with you that you serve? Um, yes. I love, 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 love just the bit I've gotten to experience. I love what you're, what you've However you birthed this in the world doesn't really matter yeah. now. It's here. Yeah, I love totally. it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so we, I mean, what I am most proud of with our company is the team that I've pulled together and that we have sort of magnetized in terms of editors, writers, and coaches. So we genuinely can help you at any stage of the game. So a lot of times people will come to us and they, are, they really want to write a book. They know they have a book in them, but they're not sure, should it be a memoir or should it be a self-help book? That kind, from that basic question, all the way through building your outline, like what should you include, especially if you're writing a, a, your memoirs. So a lot of times people, they come and they just, they're like, I have been writing, I've been journaling for 20 years. I have all these journals. I don't know what to do with them. So we can help you sort through it and figure out what is the actual story you want to tell that people are going to want to hear. And sometimes it's literally, you want to tell the story for your kids or your grandkids, and that's wonderful. And we can help you with that. But if you want, and I, I call that your local market, the people who already know and love you, you're a celebrity in their world. Every one of them is going to read it. It's your clients, it's your colleagues, it's the people that you know. They're excited you wrote a book. They want to read it. If you want to jump to the what I call the open market, you need to think about what a general reader who's never met you needs to know and leave everything out of it that they don't because it's so easy to put a book down. You know, it's a real commitment to read a book. And this is something that I think is important for authors to be to remember. How often have you read a book all the way through? How often have you left it on your bedside table and never picked it up again? Because there needs to be a compelling reason why you're reading it. And usually it's one of two things. It's either you're reading it for entertainment or you're reading it to learn something. 
And so that's one of the critical distinctions that every author needs to make as they're headed toward their book. Am I writing for somebody who wants to be entertained? And that could be, that's both positive and negative. I mean, it could be your tragic story. It's entertaining in the like global way that I'm talking about. Or are you step-by-step -step teaching them something that's going to improve their life or their health or their relationships or their business? In that case, you're, you're aiming it towards someone who wants to be taught. And a lot of times I have clients who actually want to do both. They want to teach through their story, which is completely fine, but you have to brand it and market it as the learning type of book. It's fine if your story's in there, but if you are teaching somebody something, it's much more compelling for them to buy it. I mean, this is why we always say when you are writing self-help, you're actually in the best genre because it's actually quite easy to sell self-help. As long as there's not a book that's exactly like yours on the shelf already, people are probably looking for the answer to a, a solution to a question or problem that they have versus there's a thousand people writing memoirs. How is yours going to stand out? What's going to make people actually pick yours up if they don't know you already? It's a little tougher road. So I say, fine to include your story, but if you're writing a how-to anyway, focus the title, subtitle, everything on it being the how-to, and then the reader gets delighted by encountering your story as they read and learn for themselves. Oh, it's so good. There's so much here. I mean, I could literally uh, talk all day. I'm like, are we on this? Are we, are we on the path? Like, what else? I know. No, <laughs> no it's it? really. Okay. I'm telling you about the company. Actually, we were talking about the company, and then I got yeah. off into philosophy. Um, so yes, yeah, so we help people with coaching at the beginning, coach you into your outline, coach you through the writing process, keep you accountable because that's one place where so many people fall off the wagon. They don't actually finish it. It is truly a marathon, and you need a coach to help you on your first marathon. Truly. So we offer those coaching services. And then, of course, we do offer writing services. So this is one of the big, um, you know, not even he hidden secrets of the book publishing world is that about 40% of books you see on the bookshelf have not been written solely by the person whose name is on the cover. A lot of times it's been completely written by someone else because there's a difference between an author and a writer. And some people are authors and everyone who's listening who feels the call to write, to have a book in the world, you're pro you are an author. Whether you're a writer is a different story, right? Some people yes. are great writers. It's part of their superpower. They love doing it. It's very easy for them. Other people, it's like pulling teeth. They sit down. They don't know where to start. They're confused. They feel ashamed. That just means you're, you may not be a writer. You're the author. Sometimes they're the same person, but oftentimes they're not. So no shame in that at all. We bring professional writers and pair them with authors who have a really important story or message, but are not by their nature writers. We can find you a writer who's a career book writer. That's what they do. That is their superpower. And then they take your story, your lessons, your wisdom, your voice, and put it on the page for you. Oh my gosh. I love it. <laughs> like a little light bulb went off yeah. because, you know, as somebody, look, I just felt a call to serve and help in a new yes. writing book. Yeah. I literally for a year heard it. And when you're saying that, I'm like, oh, I'm an author. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like yeah. I'm okay at writing. Yeah. I'm good at yeah. like conversational. My grammar's horrible. Like if yeah. you really look at some of my stuff I'm writing, I mean, I'm yeah. just like, look, speak from the heart, but that is brilliant. Yes. The, the author versus writer. And so yeah. you don't have to get tripped up if you're not a writer. It's yep. okay. And frankly, I love that you have really like, this is their unique brilliance. This is their gift and they can help. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And you know, I've got a lot of authors who really have had a hard time getting around their head around that. But then once they do, they will never yes. go back because the book has done so much for their business and also yeah. for their self-esteem and for their clients and for all sorts of things. And they're like, wow, that actually wasn't painful. So I right. think we have this idea that things should be painful and they have right. to be painful. They do not have to be painful, yeah, especially well, when it comes to writing a book. Well said. Well, yeah. like, amen to that. <laughs> amen. Amen to that. Question, because this is kind of a fun, I just got this little, like, I think people would want to hear this and I don't yeah. know what you want to share, but you've worked with some amazing luminaries. Yes. Um, one who, who I got to interview, we recently shared was, uh, was, was Mama Gina. And yes. Love tell everyone to read that book, especially yes. women to read. You yeah. gotta read Pussy. Gotta read How, it. like, what was that like? It was so fun. On that book. It was the most fun. It was the most fun. Oh, Regina my. is, Regina is, um, I mean, she's one of my favorite authors I've ever worked with, like top three, no question. Yeah. And you know, we, so basically she came to me, she's like, I need to write my next book. So she had written a couple books years ago. In fact, I was working at Penguin when her first book went out on submission. Mm. 
And my boss and I both read it and we loved it. And my boss actually went to her school of the womanly arts, which at the time was like 12 women in her living room, which now, by the way, she gets like 800 women showing up to her events. Oh, yeah. So just so you know, yeah. they're like, yeah, exactly. Just yeah. so you know the difference, right? Um, so she had 12 women in her in her living room and, and my boss came back just like, oh, we, we got mirrors out and looked at our pussies, you know? I just remember that. I never would forget it. And interestingly, the women who are above us on the, you know, on the ladder who got to decide what books we bought didn't didn't approve it and both that boss and I were like er you know we oh, we were so pro women and it felt like there wasn't a lot of pro women energy at the time where we were working but now I feel like oh my gosh the tides have turned hashtag me too like all the things Regina was way ahead of the time way ahead of the time I mean she was teaching women about our own internalized sexism mm. and misogyny that we get from living in a culture that's been run by the patriarchy and she's been teaching us that since like you know the late 90s <laughs> and now it's all finally really I do feel like she's been a big part of getting the word out there like you know people you don't know you can't believe how many people have actually attended her workshops and done her womanly arts school etc so she came to me and said okay I'm ready for my next book and I said great let's do it but she didn't know what to do. So this is a really good example. She's like, I don't know what to write it. I kind of want to write my story. I'm not sure. Da, da, da. So we went into a deep coaching process where for a year we worked together to get her book proposal cooked and ready. And ultimately what we decided to do, and this is really good for anyone who's listening who has an online course or a flagship product or something that you offer. What we did was we took her flagship course, her school of womanly arts course, mastery course, and we turned it into a book. So I asked her about module one on day one of the class and module two on day two, and we made them into the chapters. So just know that it's a super short shortcut for any of you who've created content that is your book outline right in front of you it's the content you've already perfected it's the content people have already shown you works you've heard their stories you've seen their successes and now you can turn it into a book so that's what we ended up doing and I got to tell you it is the most amazing book I mean you know it's just such an amazing book and you really do get such the essence of her journey as the as it illuminates all the teachings that she has put into she's really codified and made concrete in the School of Women in the Arts Mastery Training, but they came out of her own life and experiences. So we told both her story and the lessons and the how-to. So it's a really, really good book. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. I have chills even thinking about it. I've had yeah. so yeah. many friends read it. And it's so funny, something happens. I feel like people are then like, let's do like accountability on brags. Yes. And like, yes, how yes, yes. Right are you? And I'm like, totally. awesome. Yes. I have all these women. Thank you, mom. And you think Bring cleaning and yeah, yeah all oh. the tools. Yeah, yeah. What totally. a brilliant though. That is so, and I'm thinking for, for, if you're listening and you're like, oh, I actually have a course. I have a, yeah. what a brilliant thing. It's so, and you know, it's funny when you read it, it doesn't feel like, oh, that's her. No, course. not at all. Yep. Yep. Wow. Because you guys. So much of her story in there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. But that's story. how it's laid out. I mean, so this is the thing that I think people are like, oh, I don't want to, you know, a lot of times I say to people, start with a course. Don't yeah. write your book first because your a book is forever. And what if you don't get it right? Like some people are like, no, I need to write the book and then I'm going to teach a course on the book. And I say, right. That's backwards. I want, by the time you write your book, I want you to have t really test driven your content yeah. on other people and made sure that it actually works for them. And then you'll also get their stories that you can incorporate in. So it gives you more of an air of expertise when you have actual clients who you've walked through the process. So just definitely would suggest teach a course first and then use that as your book. That's a, that's the best way that it can unfold. And for me, I didn't teach a course in how to write a book, but I ran a book studio and worked with so many authors over such a long time. So it could be that you actually have a coaching practice and you've right. guided multiple clients through the same coaching process. That coaching right. process can be the chapter outline for your book. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad. Any other, before we begin to wrap up, this is so yeah. fun. Any yeah. other stories working with some of these beautiful luminaries or just anything that's, that, that you want to share or wisdom that's like still there that I didn't ask you? Because I feel like literally we could talk for 15 hours. I have like 
thousands of more questions about books, but love, like, I love this, like teach the course, then write the book. But there's yes. so many yes. things. Is there anything else, Kelly, you're like, oh, here's a little funny story here. Or I want to make sure I share this. I'll just like say, yeah. open heart flare. Sure, sure. I mean, this is what comes up. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about Janine Roth. Do you know the author? Oh, Janine I Roth? love yeah. Janine. Yeah, Janine Roth. Roth. She's, she wrote Women, Food, and God and many other books before that. And she's just recently been diagnosed with cancer. So I've been seeing her on Facebook. So we're sending mm-hmm. prayers to Janine. But yeah. um, I was actually just a baby, a, like I was a, a baby editor. I was, I think, an associate editor working um, at the Plume imprint, which is a paperback imprint um, that worked closely with Viking, which was a um, hardcover imprint. And Janine had had her books published, I think, by Viking back in the day. It was like, this was in the, you know, early 2000s. And she, we decided to do a 20-year repackage of her book, When Food is Love. And so I got to work with her on her repackage of that book and one other book that she was, um, that we were repackaging, meaning we just put a new fresh cover on it, made it look up to date so it didn't look quite so dusty. You know, the covers date themselves over time. And these had been, yeah. you know, out for 10 and 15 years or 20 and 15 years. Um, and I remember being on the phone with her and her saying to me, wouldn't it be amazing if this repackage of When Food is Love finally hit the New York Times list, like a book of mine finally hit the New York Times list. And I'm going to tell you, as like a kind of, you know, New Yorker, like at the time I was sort of playing that ego, you know, game, I was kind of like, you know, a little cynical. And I said, I was thinking to myself, there's just no way we're not even going to have enough books in the marketplace to hit the New York Times list. And there was a part of me that thought like, authors are so delusional, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fast forward like 10 years and Women, Food and God gets picked up by Oprah. Like Janine just kept writing. She just kept writing and she was Mm -hmm. impacting so many people's lives and changing and transforming people's lives through her books. Mm -hmm. And she just kept going. And then she wrote Women, Food and God and it got picked up by Oprah. And next thing you know, she's a number one New York Times bestseller. And so I just want to say, I think she knew somewhere deep in her heart that that's what she was destined for. She knew it. And my like cynical young mind was like, whatever, but she was following her intuition. And I am grateful to have to say that I've now jumped onto that path myself, but it took something, you know, to get out of the ego mind and into the intuitive mind. And I know she knew that was her destiny and that was her future. So, and she'd been working at it for 20 years at that point. We were doing a 20 year repackage and it was years later even that Women, Food and God hit the New York Times list. So I just wanna say like, keep going. That's my inspiring story to all of you to keep going. If you hear that book dream in your heart, there's a reason why it's there and there's proof all around you that your dream can come true. Oh my gosh. Thank you. What, first of all, I love her. She's, yes, she's wonderful. Brilliant. Love her books. They've really yeah. helped me. Yeah. Beautiful story. I love that, that like, it's a slow cooker. Yeah. Years, it's a yep. slow cooker. It's like the Harrison Ford. It took him 20 years <laughs> to become overnight success. Exactly. Whatever that is. Like, yes. it's not, you just, you keep at it because it's your heart's you know, and then also just to say, I mean, some people don't get famous till after they die. I don't want that to be for you, but like, don't, right. don't underestimate yourself. You know what I mean? Like we don't know what life wants for us. We can only follow that impulsive desire, which is how life talks to us. So mm. if you're hearing that, write the book, write the book oh. and let life do the rest. <laughs> write the book, let it be born. Let can literary arts help you? Cause you yes. guys are not. Yes. brilliant and We'd really love to. yeah you and your team awesome kelly thank you so much this is so fun you so are happy to be here thank you so much for having me delicious you are delicious <laughs> <laughs>